Gentlemen, uh, this is Brian Munson from NCBA CLUSA. Thank you for taking some time this afternoon to join our policy and legislative advocacy webinar. Uh, I'm going to turn the webinar over to Alan Knapp. Uh, he's going to be your moderator this afternoon, and uh, we'll get things started. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Alan Knapp. I am NCBA CLUSA's Vice President of Advocacy, and with me today is uh, uh, John McKechnie and John Weinfurter, who um, are legislative counsels and are following things very, very closely on the Hill. And um, now, uh, today is, is August 1st. It is uh, very near, um, or has started, the, the long congressional recess. Um, uh, and uh, a lot of things have happened during the summer, and I think they're going to br uh, brief everybody on um, kind of where we are with uh, uh, leadership changes that have recently occurred with um, uh, Eric Cantor losing his uh, majority leader. Uh, position and uh, with elections coming up uh, um, in a few months, and uh, uh, kind of full-time campaign mode for for many members. A um, lot of a uh, lot of changes, and then we're going to run through a list of, of several op uh, topics um, of things that we've been involved in um, currently, and what we will be continue to be involved in uh, coming this fall. So, uh, uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to. Uh, um, we'll have John Weinberger start and, and and talk a little bit about some of the leadership changes and. Well, I think I should begin by saying that John McKechnie, Alan Knapp, and I just returned from Capitol Hill about 20 minutes ago, uh, spending the morning up there meeting with uh, staff that are very much involved in the NCBA CLUSA dialogue between the legislative branch and our offices here downtown. And uh, today was supposed to be, as most of you all know, the first day of recess. But we've had a colossal screw-up in the House yet again with, in, in this case, the Republicans on the House side not being able to hold their votes on the border security bill, which is considered mandatory for passage before they leave for their August recess. It appears as though the Republican leadership couldn't hold their votes last night. They broke for a couple of hours. They came back, tried to re-vote, couldn't re-vote. So they postponed consideration of that bill until today. And it's even with leadership, Republican staff, it's highly uncertain what happens today, at what time, does it happen tonight, is there a vote tomorrow? We know none of the answers to any of those questions, um, which brings us to the issue of the new leadership for the majority in the House. As you all know, Eric Cantor lost his uh, Republican primary to a guy named David Bratt back in uh, late June, I think, wasn't it? And um, therefore lost his title as majority leader as well. Um, he actually stepped down from the majority leader's job last night, gave his farewell speech in the House chamber yesterday, and announced that he was not going to hang around until January 3rd to be a, a, a part of the ending of the 113th Congress, but announced that, in fact, he was leaving Congress on August 18th. Um, so with that, um, Kevin McCarthy from California moved into the uh, majority leaders' offices, and Steve Scalise from Louisiana has moved into Mr. McCarthy's majority whip office. Um, Mr. Scalise's first test was yesterday in terms of rounding up and holding the votes for the border security bill, which, as you can tell, didn't work out too well. So we have problems in the leadership in the House. We have a kind of a dysfunctional Democratic Party in the Senate. Um, we have most legislative initiatives in the House and the Senate going absolutely nowhere. Um, it looks as though the single greatest accomplishment of this Congress will be passage of the Farm Bill. Do you agree, John and Alan? I think that that's probably one of the, uh, the one things that, that this Congress can point at is having done successfully. Um, the appropriations bills are a disaster. Tax reform is nowhere. Uh, the immigration bill, as you all know, is nowhere. They're all on the desk for leadership in the Senate and the House to look at either during the lame duck, which is roughly 12 to 14 legislative days, or in the 114th Congress. We, we just aren't in a position, as is anyone in this city, to forecast where any of those things go or when they're looked at by, by the uh, respective members of the, the Senate or the House. Um, I wish I could come to you with a much more significant hit list of what's been done, but we just can't. There's not much out there that we can put a flag up against and say it's done. So, um, Alan? What do you uh, John Weinford, thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to John McKechnie and, and um, have him uh, give some thoughts as well. September is going to be uh, a short but per perhaps intense month 
Uh, yesterday, Senate Majority Leader Reid said he was going to send the Senate home on September 23rd. They're getting back here September 8th, so that's not a lot of time there, but we can be twinked. And there's, a, there's also a, a, a holiday week in between, I think, for, uh, for Rosh Hashanah. So essentially what both chambers have to try to do is get past a continuing resolution to keep the government open after October 1st. That's going to be a very politically charged and difficult thing to do given how close the election is. And both sides are wanting to pass what I call talking point bills. But if the CR doesn't get done, then the government potentially for, two, for the second year in a row could shut down. Right before an election, right before it'll be a disaster. Yeah. So this is going to be September is going to be a fairly intense month just to just to agree to keep the government open. Um, just to kind of echo what John Weinberger said, that it's very difficult given the divisions between the two parties. It's difficult to get any meaningful legislation done. So we're uh, in that environment, though. We're continuing. I think as as uh, as John Weinberger alluded to, we're continuing to make sure that we elevate the profile of the co-op community and NCBA with a lot of the key staff so that when we do get into a position next Congress maybe to move some things, they'll know who we are and what we do. And that's a good point, um, John. And there, there's a lot of work that is going um, on behind the scenes. There's a lot of groundwork being laid. Um, if, if not a, um, a, a largely active Congress, um, there's a lot of work going on behind the, the, the scenes in terms of laying some really central groundwork for a lot of really important elements. Um, you know that are that are affecting um, cooperative issues. Um, one of our first agenda items today will just be a quick update on the uh, fiscal year 2015 appropriations process. Um, again, as as uh, both uh, John Weinberg and John McKechnie mentioned, um, we've only had a couple of these bills that have been through um, or have have seen some action and have been passed by the respective chambers. Um, one of the things that we are uh, following very closely is the um, uh, the Rural Cooperative Development Grant Program in the uh, Agriculture Appropriations Bill. And um, we, we received some really good, since our last webinar, um, we, we received some really good news on that in terms of uh, where both the House and the Senate have marked up their version of it, um, essentially uh, restoring um, the RCDG funds um, back to what last year's levels were in, in fiscal year 14, um, rejecting the President's budget request to um, consolidate it into another program. Um, and that was a, quite a, a, a big legislative win, I think, for... Um, that was a uh, huge coup. It was. And, and for the, the um, you know, for if, if people were called back in, in the fiscal year 2014 process when the budget came out, um, uh, consolidating the RCDG request, the, uh, uh, the House, which is controlled by the Republicans, uh, basically agreed to that and zeroed out funding for the RCDG um, grant program. Um, that did not happen this time around. And, and there was a lot of folks that um, did a lot of uh, direct advocacy. There was a lot of folks that uh, um, did a lot of um, grassroots advocacy to get that message out. Um, and I think um, you know when we talk about where we go um, as a co-op movement going forward, it's really about this idea of engagement and um, the idea of, of, of um, being made aware of issues and bringing it to the forefront and really taking action and, and communicating that. I think this is a perfect example of, of how that can be done in, in not only this issue, but, but several other issues and as I, well. I think it's fair to say that we had Republican and Democratic friends within the appropriations community and in other committees that came to our assistance, that fought their own parties, and that fought the White House on this. And they ultimately prevailed, which we thank God they did. Well, and it's a you know it's a message too. I think we had a um, a, a, a little bit off subject here, but we had a, a meeting with um, Lillian Salerno, who runs the USDA Rural Development Program, basically the administrator of the RCDG program, and said that in in um, recent months the um, uh, Congress has been much more uh, uh, deliberate in terms of receiving. Um, information about the effectiveness of the RCDG program um, and grants. They're interested in the, um, in the overall what is the, the benefit of that, how is the money being used, what is it being used for. I think it's a really good opportunity for us uh, as a, a co-op movement to really talk about the success stories that the RCDG funds provide, um, where, you know, what, what programs do they sustain, um, how many jobs are they are are they creating? How many uh, businesses are they creating? And things like that uh, that we can continue to help 
um, again, lay, lay the groundwork for, uh, for this um, uh, in the future. I think we'll see um, in the lame duck session after the elections um, something after uh, uh, maybe sort of an omnibus or, a, or a, um, some sort of resolution that would continue um, uh, to, to pass this. And, and to, but the good, the good news is I think we're on good footing with the, um, both the marks that we received in both the House and the Senate, which are very, very identical um, to, uh, to this process. Uh, the next item on the list is um, where are we with tax reform? And um, that was a, a, a quite a, a converse, topic of conversation earlier um, this year. Um, now that we're here in the summertime, um, you know, where do things stand with, with tax reform and, and its effect on credit unions and other cooperatives? Um, John McKechnie, I would like to have you um, weigh in on this, uh, this issue. The, um, the prospects of big tax reform, I think, depend somewhat on who controls the Senate next year. I think it's fairly certain that the House is going to be, continue to have a Republican majority. It's, it's unclear um, you know, where the Senate's going to end up. I mean, some people say that the Republicans can pick up anywhere between four and eight seats. If they pick up four, they don't get the majority. If they pick up seven or eight, they do. That's a long way of saying the tax reform, I think, is going to be much more viable if you have two Republican majorities, if you have a Republican House and Republican Senate, um, if it's if it's uh, Paul Ryan who is considered to be the front runner to get the Ways and Means Committee chairmanship on the House side, it's he is not really committed to taking Dave Camp's work that he did in this Congress and use that as his baseline for next Congress. Some people hoped he would, some people didn't. Um, you know, that bill is, is, I think some people are very happy with that bill. Some people are, are clearly unhappy. Bottom line is that comprehensive tax reform may still be unachievable in the next Congress. But I think there are pieces of the tax code that look to me to be more likely to, um, to receive attention. Um, from our perspective, there's, there certainly looks like uh, continuing consensus that this LIFO issue last in, first out, uh, that is always on the lips of tax writers in both the House and the Senate, Democrat and Republican. That seems to have, a consensus seems to have emerged around that, that that's something that a lot of people in the Hill want to get rid of. Great. Uh, John Weinberg, any comments on tax reform? Oh, I would uh, largely agree with everything that, that John said. Um, I would add that those of us here at NCBA in our multiple trips to the Hill build relationships with both majority and minority staff on Senate Finance and House Ways and Means. And I think John would agree that we've had an earthquake up there now in terms of who for the D's and the R's in the Senate and who for the D's and the R's in the House are doing what issue. And we can, we can assume that this will continue to happen until January next year. Um, Baucus and Wyden have been kind of tag-teaming each other on their staff. Most of the Baucus staff have departed now in the wake of Max Box's appointment as U.S. Ambassador to China, um, but the Wyden people are largely still getting their feet wet on tax reform and on tax in general. On the uh, House side, the camp staff are, in some cases, hoping to be asked to stay. Some are looking for new jobs. Um, a good friend of mine that I worked on with uh, a couple of clients is departing town and moving to Brazil, which is about as far away from Washington as you can get. Um, so I think we're going to have to wait and see who's where come September, October, November, December before we decide on priorities and achievable goals. Um, I will say that, that um, within the tax reform area, I think the R&D tax and I think the child uh, education tax credit, if there is no tax reform, they will move forward as independent bills. Um, John, would you agree with that? Yeah, I think that might be more piecemeal. Yeah, I, and I think we could see that. I think we could see tax reform unravel and have 10, 12, 15 different tax-related pieces of legislation come forward, which of course makes this much, much more complicated. Great. Thank you very much. And, and one item to note, too, um, our, our organization is putting together um, an inaugural co-op professionals conference this fall in Denver, Colorado, um, with the idea being is that this would be the first time that um, we would convene a group of uh, co-op professionals, these are accountants, CPAs, lawyers that, uh, that um, handle uh, cooperative finance issues, 
um, tax reform issues um, on on the grassroots level. Um, this is this is at the you know where the um, you know where where co-ops are operating in, and and really I think it's an opportunity to help um, this group. And I encourage everybody who um, is is a co-op professional on the call or listening today um, to take part in and looking at being involved in that because I think really this co-op professionals group is is going to lay a lot of um, a lot of uh, information on what issues that we need to pay attention to. Um, where where are co-ops being affected? Um, how we can raise those concerns in in state legislatures or in in the halls of Congress, um, and and really where those points are and where we need to be attended to, and what are you know what is the the, the effect of LIFO and FIFO on on uh, on cooperative businesses? You know those those are some of the things that I think we need to um, and I, again just hearing from the the folks that are um, that are on the ground working on these issues. What are those main issues? Um, that, that raise to, those, to the levels of that we need to take some collective action as, yes. uh, as a movement. As much as we talked this year about the blank slate approach and about how both Chairman Camp on the House side and Chairman Baucus on the Senate side were trying to start with a comprehensive tax reform based on looking at the tax code from, again, from a blank slate perspective, next year I don't think is going to have that same dynamic. I think you're going to have two completely new chairmen. You know, the House Whatever happens. Yeah, the House is going to be most likely Paul Ryan, the Senate. Who knows who that's going to be? It could be Ron Widener or Orrin Hatch. The point is that um, it's not entirely clear that they're going to look at the work that's been done in this Congress and use that as a baseline. It really may not be that at all. In which case, this, that might mean that the horizon for getting tax reform done may slip another two years or beyond. You know, it's it is if it's a pride of authorship issue. Sure, it, it is a very complicated process. You know the. The last time a big tax reform bill was passed, it was 1986. You had a divided Congress. You had a uh, president's party was was also the Senate party back then, and the House was a different party. But so it can be done in a divided environment. And you had a House Ways and Means Committee chairman who was arguably the most important and most uh, the strongest member of the Democratic coalition in the House. Yeah. So you had you had a you had a, it was it's never easy to do something this big. Great, thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, a little bit of our, on our uh, uh, now that we're on talking about our international update, and I think this is a really good opportunity for us to talk a little bit about um, uh, where we are in some of our international work um, and and what is going on here. And and um, I would also like to uh, uh, to talk about how uh, this has a, an impact in a lot of our um, international um, trade work that we're doing right now with uh, some of our domestic work. Um, that we're doing. So we're currently operating uh, projects in 15 countries. We had um, uh, just got back from Capitol Hill with a meeting with the um, uh, U.S. House of Representatives, um, House Foreign Affairs Committee, um, Africa Subcommittee, uh, to, to give them an update and, and to continue the dialogue and talking about some of our work in those 15 program or 15 uh, countries that we're working in, um, really regarding um, around food security, um, uh, food for progress. Uh, many of the ideas that that our international team is really working hard at is really raising those the profile of the work we do and and how um, and how really the you know the the work of co-ops in uh, in the field in in foreign in, in the foreign field are uh, not traditionally foreign uh, what development is not traditionally what is viewed as as foreign aid it's really a, a, a really a, a represents a private sector approach that com combines humanitarian concerns with business discipline and really kind of getting our um, the, the foreign affairs um, individuals and the policymakers and elected officials familiar with with that work and the work that we're doing um, over there. I think that's a, an ongoing uh, conversation. We're looking at uh, uh, doing an event sometime this fall um, uh, on Capitol Hill um, hosted by the committee. Um, we talked about that um, to really kind of raise these concerns, have a, have a forum where we can have um, uh, invite staff who are interested in hearing about our work and, and about our methods of, of international development um, and have them come hear about what we're doing um, globally um, as a way of connecting um, a lot of the work that uh, that we're doing domestically. So um, anything to add on this uh, um, front, John Weinford, John McKechnie? 
I would just add that the, uh, the briefings would inherently be uh, uh, bipartisan in nature and that we would uh, use our own street creds to draw staff to the event, but we would also ask staff to invite like-minded staff to come as well. And I think we could draw a pretty impressive group of staff, and I think we could assemble a pretty damn good panel. This is a co-op 101 opportunity. I mean, I think that we can educate staff, a lot of staff turnover. We need to continue to the process of making sure that people know, know and understand co-op movement and what we can do. Republicans and Democrats tend to look at co-ops differently, and I think it, but there's plenty of appeal to be had with both. And I think we, the, the, these kind of briefings are just part of the process where we're trying to elevate the, you know, the, the entire co-op community's profile on Capitol Hill. Because I think if we elevate our profile and people know what we do and understand what we do, I think that they're going to be a lot more likely to, to provide us with the government aid that we want and that uh, that can go a long way toward helping further our goals. And, and you know, one of the things, too, on a, on a policy level, and, and uh, we had a, uh, I had a meeting that uh, uh, had last week with uh, Representative Adam Schiff from California, who's on the State and Foreign Office Appropriations Committee, and um, really really prepped what is going on right now, and that's a period of, of um, growing isolationism on a feeling that America has been stretched too thin around the world um, with all of the international conflicts that are going on. Um, he mentioned that there's a desire not only from his constituents, but he's hearing it from, from other, uh, others, you know, his colleagues, that there's a desire to pull, there's a desire to pull back. There's a desire to say, they call it the withdrawal syndrome. Exactly. Yeah. And, and um, you know, and, and how, how do those sentiments um, a, reflect on future uh, foreign aid budgets um, that come down through the White House. How do they affect future appropriations? Um, how do we sustain that level of funding um, to really um, drive a lot of our international work? I think as an organization, we work closely with um, uh, other groups like Interaction and USGLC and the Overseas Cooperative Development to, to really um, uh, help relay that information that, that we need. There's a still a focus and a need to be engaged internationally. And, and um, I think the best way that we can do that is, is to continue, you know, one of the things that, um, uh, you know, that, that we pride ourselves on as an organization is that um, um, the work that we're doing is good for business and trade. It's good for our national security. Um, it's good for America's moral standing in the world. And I think um, there's a, a message there to continue to, to, to play out um, with, with a lot of those folks. and, and um, showing and showcasing success stories that we're having around the world in, in terms of uh, um, self-empowerment and resiliency. And, and um, um, I think it's, it's a, a conversation that we need to continue to work at and tell, um, uh, and those stories that we need to tell abroad. So moving on to our next topic, um, uh, recently had an opportunity to um, work with uh, Representative Shaka Fatah. I was invited to his um, uh, his monthly program called the Capital Idea, which he um, sends out to um, many households in, in his state of Pennsylvania in the growing Philadelphia area. Um, really, he wanted, he invited myself to talk about the role of cooperatives and the work that NCBA does. Also with, with me was uh, Mary Alex Blanton from National Cooperative Bank um, to really talk about um, how can we um, grow co-op development? Um, there was a talk about his bill, H.R. 2437, the Creating Jobs Through Cooperatives Act, um, and talking about the need for that. I think um, Representative Fatah is still a very um, um, interested policymaker, um, and he's, he's opened ideas to make this legislation um, uh, be more impactful. He's, he's looking for um, you know, additional co-sponsors. He's looking maybe for um, the bill to be perfected in some ways. He, I don't think he has any pride of ownership on this issue. I think he wants to make sure that we're um, um, looking at ways in which to uh, promote cooperatives. Um, uh, the program also featured a local food co-op in Philadelphia called Weaver's Way, um, which uh, really talked a lot about how, uh, uh, how this food co-op came about and, and how it's servicing its members. Um, it's a really great, great show. Um, I um, encourage any of you to check that out and, and to hear about uh, um, what Congressman Fatah's views are. I think there was a lot of talk about, uh, um, you know, his, his feeling is that, um, you know, co-ops are great in terms of employee ownership and succession planning when, when businesses um, oftentimes, uh, he mentioned when businesses oftentimes um, are uh, family businesses are often um, uh, uh, 
folded that uh, they're they're lost if they don't if the employees themselves don't own that. So I think he, he had a really good comment about um, uh, succession planning and and uh, and how we do that. Um, recently, we uh, uh, attended our next uh, topic of, of here is, is really our, our co-op trade, and it, it really ties nicely, I think, with a lot of our international work that we're uh, that we're doing. But um, recently, the White House Rural Council convened their first ever uh, Rural Opportunity Investment Conference um, last week here in Washington D.C. Um, uh, CoBank was a, a big participant in that and announced um, a large amount of money to help. Um, fund this project um, going forward, but it was really an opportunity to bring together um, with the goal being is that brings together a lot of folks that are engaged in, uh, in, in uh, rural America. Um, how do we create rural opportunity through trade? How do we, how do we grow that? How do we provide um, linkages to, uh, to capital? How do we provide, um, you know, how do we obtain successes in that space? Um, we recently had a meeting with um, the USDA Foreign Ag, foreign, um, ag Service um, talking about these very things as well. Um, we're, we're looking at, NCBA CLUSA is looking at, um, with the, the, the information that we obtained in these meetings, looking at um, the Emerging Markets Program Grant or a Market Access Program Grant or um, there's the Cochrane Fellows um, uh, named after Senator Thad Cochrane. Um, that are opportunities for NCBA CLUSA to be more engaged with the development of, of co-ops. Um, we are um, constantly engaged with other nations that want to come for um, visits to the United States. Um, we're, we're looking at hosting the, um, uh, one of the ministries in Romania next week. Um, we've had groups from Turkey, we've had groups from Brazil um, that are interested. I think there's a space in here for us to work at um, how we can look at trade um, markets with some of these countries and, and leveraging some of the federal uh, grant programs in a, in a coordinated way and, and um, oftentimes help in, in some impoverished and rural communities throughout America, which really ties in with what the White House Rural Council um, is, is doing and, and really making sure we coalesce around those areas. Um, John McKechnie, John Weinberger, anything to add on, on um, uh, co-op trade in this, in this kind of concept of, of John, I could add one thing. Um, one thing that I would like to say is that I, I assume all of you think that, that McKechnie and, and Alan and I spend all of our time on the Hill. But one thing that we do, and I think we do quite well, is we try to keep co-ops high on the White House agenda, as evidenced by the West Wing Party celebrating the 100th anniversary of the, of the uh, cooperative movement a year and a half ago, Alan's meetings with the Foreign Agricultural Service uh, last week, the, the West Wing program on trade. But what we also try to do is we try to improve the communication process between the White House and the Senate and the White House and the, the uh, House. And we try to encourage uh, congressional staff to realize that there are lots of things happening at the White House that involve this very issue. And I think that's a very good thing for us to do because it certainly increases their attention span if they know that there are levels of activity moving on a variety of playing fields. And I think that we, we uh, try to do that, and it's fun to do. And I think that John and Alan and I have been pretty productive down there at the White House doing it. John? I think we're, everything we're doing is, is trying to make sure the co-ops are, are in the top, top of people's minds rather than an afterthought. And, uh, you know, co-ops, unless we continue to, to advocate for what we do and in, unless we try to, uh, to really um, make a, a, a concerted effort, uh, a lot of Hill staff in, in, in the generic white co-ops, but in the specific when it gets time to writing bills, they don't think of us first. And again, I want to make sure that they connect the dots about how important we are back home and about how important we are um, in the communities and overseas. The, 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 the economic story we can tell alone is, is phenomenal. It's just a matter of us telling it. Yeah, and, and you know, this has really has come about, um, this uh, uh, White House Rural Council initiative was announced, um, I believe, earlier in February of this year. Um, it, it's really a, um, the administration's priority to um, look at the, the broader aspects of poverty alleviation, um, ways in which we can lift impoverished communities in rural America out of that. Um, one of the ways that they're looking at is, is this greater uh, focus on and coordinated and concerted effort towards um, better international trade. Um, um, the meeting we just had in the um, at 
in the uh, House Foreign Affairs Committee, we were we were talking about a uh, there's a bill uh, called HR 1777, which is increasing American jobs through Greater Exports to Africa Act. Um, it's a bipartisan bill that we're we're looking at um, getting further information about and seeing if we can be involved in it. But it's really um, the the bill is all about promoting the alignment of of U.S. commercial interests, um, which which many of our uh, uh, potential exporters would, would have an interest in um, with some of the development priorities in Africa that we've already been doing and we've been doing for years. Um, um, so figuring out how we can connect all of those, um, all of those dots and, and, and hearing from all of you um, about ways in which we can be more engaged in those areas I think are, are um, important next steps. Um, just a couple of other um, uh, items here that, uh, that we're looking at um, is the um, is a number of housing cooperatives, and this has been an issue that we've um, that we've been addressed uh, been been addressing since um, uh, the hurricane that hit, or the storm Superstorm Sandy that hit uh, the New York New Jersey area, and um, what we've been working with with um, Congressman Israel on is in um, the fiscal year 2014 appropriations process there was a request for a uh, FEMA study uh, by Representative Israel. Um, to ask FEMA about the availability of uh, co-op housing to obtain federal disaster assistance for this. Um, that report has come out. Um, it came out here on, on May 22nd um, uh, recently. It, it reaffirmed um, kind of FEMA's goal that, uh, or FEMA's announcement that um, uh, the Stafford Act and laws uh, regarding the individual assistance would have to be changed. Uh, to do that, it was um, not to the liking of Congressman Israel. It was asked for a, a private meeting with um, uh, Secretary Johnson to, to talk about this issue a little bit further. Um, we've um, been talking with his office. We've been talking with the, um, uh, the Nas National Association of Housing Cooperatives about this issue. So um, stay tuned on this issue. We're still um, engaged on it. We're still looking at ways of um, you know which to address this. Um, I would like to say too that we've had um, uh, initial conversations. Many of you, and we've talked about the farm bill being one of the big, the big issues um, that that came out of, of this current Congress. And one of those is the um, interagency working group that we've been working with with USDA. Um, we've had some initial conversations with them. Um, the idea of bringing a lot of these federal agencies, FEMA, for example, um, SBA. Um, uh, a lot of other federal agencies that are involved in co-op development to the table to talk about some of these issues. Um, this is precisely the, the area that we need to be involved in and hear from uh, not only the, the housing cooperatives groups, but also other, other co-op groups that are having um, concerns and policy issues uh, that we need to, to make a part of that interagency working group going forward. We've had some initial conversations. Again, Lillian Salerno from USDA has been um, very active on, on convening uh, at least initially trying to get an understanding of, of some of the breadth of the issues um, and, and outside of the USDA purview that uh, that co-ops are facing in some of the other federal agencies. So um, I think we'll move on. Our next uh, uh, topic of conversation is, um, is, is looking at how do we represent um, um, education cooperatives. Um, uh, there's a um, a group that is a member of NCBA CLUSA called the Parent Cooperative Preschools International, um, who run about 300 preschools, um, cooperative preschools nationwide. Um, there are about a, over a thousand co-op preschools nationwide that are not part of, uh, or that's the total number, but uh, about 300 of them are with the PCPI group. And we've been having some conversations with them about, uh, there's a lot of federal attention about um, uh, expanded early learning opportunities. Um, and it's mainly, a, it's, it's going to be a very bipartisan issue, I think, the, the need for, for stronger early learning. Um, and we've had conversations with, with PCPI about, um, and we've had conversations with um, some folks in the Office of uh, Elementary and Secondary Education at the Department of Education um, who are interested in hearing a little bit more about the role of education co-ops, how um, the development or expansion of education co-ops can help address the, the need for um, better early learning. Um, right now there was a report that came out that said about uh, uh, four in ten kids are receiving um, quality early learning that prepares them for uh, uh, the K-12 K through 12 system. Um, there's a desire to grow that number, obviously, to, to make sure we're not leaving 
um, no pun intended, and leaving no child left behind. Um, but how can co-ops help fill that void? And, and one of the conversations we've had is with Congressman Pocan, who is on the um, House Education and Workforce Committee. We've also had conversations um, a little bit about this with Senator Baldwin, who's also on the Senate Health, um, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee that, that deals with these issues. Um, so we're re really excited about moving in this space to talk about the role of, of co-op development um, in the education space. John, and the one thing I'd add, too, is that, that I've heard from POCAN staff and from Baldwin staff that Republican leadership staff in the House have actually had a couple of meetings talking about the education agenda in the next Congress. And they say that there's likely to be a higher ed reauthorization bill in the, the uh, 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 114th Congress, which would be just the opportunity for our friends to move on our behalf. That's great. Well, if there are any questions um, uh, from the panel, I, I, I'm looking um, to. If there are any questions, we'll uh, we'll be here on the line, and we can um, we can take them. If not, I, I can. Um, we'll we'll continue to have uh, have John McKechnie and John Weinfer do, uh, do do some closing statements here. And if there are any questions in the meantime, uh, you know, please feel free to uh, to provide your questions. But uh, John McKechnie, let me ask you a little bit. We're um, um, so we have a uh, we have our annual conference coming up in in September, um, and we're also looking at um, our next annual conference in Washington D.C. in May, um, and and kind of carrying on this topic of engagement and and grassroots engagement specifically around a lot of these issues. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about how we can help better lay the groundwork for a potential opportunity to be more engaged on these issues and be more impactful when we talk to Congress? Well, I know Alan and Mike, Mike Bell, have uh, scheduled a session in Minneapolis that I would hope everybody on the call and others can attend, and that is a something kind of a, a advocacy, grassroots, uh, pr kind of a, almost a, a basic groundwork laying session where we can talk about the the ABCs of advocacy, why it's important, what it can do uh, to help your co-op. You know, like I said earlier in the call, we have such a good story to tell. Sometimes in my travels on the Hill, I get frustrated that, that not enough people really understand where co-ops fit, and they don't completely understand what our role is. So I think part of this, this and I, I don't want to steal Alan's thunder because he's sort of the mastermind behind the session, but Part of the, the aim is going to be to, to equip our community with some of the tools on how to get our message across, how to develop relationships, how to make sure that we are in the front row of the discussions on Capitol Hill and in the administration. You know, my, one of my favorite sayings about Washington is that if you're not at the table, then you're on the menu. And I really believe that we have to make sure we're at the table and make sure that we have our our voice is heard and understood by our lawmakers. So that, I'm looking forward to that Minneapolis sessions. I, I session. I think it's going to be September the 11th in the morning. I, I believe is that right, Alan? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. John Weinberg. Um, I too am looking forward to being a part of the uh, September gathering. Um, although it will be at, at the height of the fall campaign season. Um, I just want to offer a couple of thoughts on the fall elections, too. I think that uh, uh, there is no one out there in the polling community and the political consultant community that can really draw any legitimate conclusions as to what we're looking at in the Senate or in the House. Um, I think that anything and everything is on the table. It will be very interesting to see what happens on November 4th or 5th um, as the, the numbers come rolling in on election night. However, the uh, NCBA gathering here in Washington in um, uh, May next year offers us an incredible opportunity to reach out and, and meet with and interface with uh, members of Congress and their staffs. And uh, we are just now beginning to plan sort of the details of the, uh, the May program. But part of that May program will involve many of you and many of us going to the Hill for two days and meeting with, with our local representatives, our local senators, and our staffs from our home states. And we know that you guys will do a great job in telling your stories and in, in eliciting a response from the staff and the members that you meet with up there. Um, and it will be our job to help you do that 
um, and to help you script the stories that you tell the staff and you tell the members. And the end product, we hope, would be a far more educated group of legislators and legislative staff that we meet with on, on a daily and weekly basis. Alan? Great. We have just a couple of questions here before we um, adjourn. And uh, the first question um, that came in is, is um, there was some uh, uh, clarification needed on the, um, the bill number for the Creating Jobs Through Cooperatives Act. This is the um, Representative Fatah bill. And um, that HR number is 2437. And again, what his bill does is um, it creates an opportunity um, primarily for, I believe, a lot of urban cooperatives uh, to work with a lot of nonprofit organizations, um, universities, um, et cetera, to work in, in um, areas of uh, economic need. These would be in census tracts that are deemed um, uh, low income. And it's really an opportunity to provide um, uh, seed money or, or uh, development money to help provide um, the establishment of more cooperatives. Uh, the other question that we got are, are you know, what other organizations are NCBA allying with when it comes to advocating for cooperative development, encouraging the sale of um, businesses to, um, to their employees? Um, this was a, a question that, um, that Representative Fatah is very interested in as well. And um, I believe a lot of the worker cooperatives that are, are joining, and, and we've, um, you know, we're working a lot with the, uh, the worker cooperative movement, um, because this is really the main, the main ally when it comes to um, the sale of businesses to the, to the workers. And so we are working with, with them directly. So to, to close here, we're, we're um, hopefully to see many of you in, in Minneapolis um, uh, on September, uh, um, I believe, 9th, 8th through the 11th. Um, and then we are going to um, have another webinar scheduled um, during November. This will be after the elections. Um, and we hopefully we'll be able to talk to um, all of you and update you on where things stand at the end of uh, the current Congress and the results of the elections and the uh, lame duck session and, and where we go um, going into the next year. Uh, so again, I'd like to thank everybody for um, listening today and attending. Um, and thank you very much for your time and, and have a great August. Thank you.